So welcome back to Researcher's Desk after the uh, uh, winter holidays. It's an enormous pleasure for me to welcome my good friend, Simon Hallett. Simon's, uh, we went to college together in England um, a few years ago. I'm not going to admit how many. Um, and uh, we've gone different we've gone different pathways in life. Um, and Simon is working in investment uh, in London, and he's kindly agreed to speak with us about uh, net zero um, from an investment perspective. Uh, Simon heads uh, is head of climate at his organization. So it's going to be really fascinating listening to him. So Simon, a warm welcome to Researcher's Desk. Uh, I'm going to turn my own video off, uh, and uh, am I, um, but uh, I will be in the background. And if your pictures don't show up when they should, I will suddenly pop up and tell you that. So don't worry. So well, warm welcome, Simon. Oh, th thanks so much, Alistair. <clears throat> and uh, I'm sorry you're disappearing because it, it's quite disconcerting talking to a a, a, a room full of, of names on the screen. Then I'm going to stay just, here. Yeah, stare at least one human being. You're going to stare. It, it feel... I'm back. <laughs> That's great. That's lovely. Um, so it, it's great to have the chance to talk to this. Admittedly, it's a really big topic. So I gather the the idea of these sessions is is it's mostly Q and A. So so that I'll talk try and talk for twenty minutes or no more than that, and then really see where the group wants has interest and wants to go. Because the last thing I want to do is sort of lecture you on things that are either irrelevant or that you know already. Um, and the only thing other thing to note is I'm I'm obviously doing this in in my personal capacity. Uh, when I share some slides. They've got a bit of our corporate branding on it. So I'd ask you just to ignore that. That's not the firm talking, it's me talking, but it's just easier for me to, to put the presentation together. Um, so what I'll do is, oh, I'll, I'll just a little bit more about myself, is that the firm I work for, we advise on large institutions on their long-term investment strategy. We don't sort of pick securities, stocks and bonds. It, it's much more policy orientated uh, at the work that we do. Um, but we have an increasing number of clients who are very environmentally focused, some of whom have not adopted net zero strategies. And the challenge for us is the big picture of how do we incorporate uh, the fact of climate change into what we do for all clients, which is obviously what we should do, and then what more can we do with clients who themselves want to go more? And there's a whole uh, a question about intent and obligation and legal things that we could we can touch on the second. So that's where uh, I'm coming from. I'll start off with a little bit of background and level setting about how we see the net zero imperative and how it translates through to the economy and, and to markets beforehand. And uh, apologies to... To those of you for whom this is 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 might be really obvious, um, but I just thought it would be good to get us to um, to all the same place. So I'm going to share my screen, um, and the screen I wanted to share has disappeared. There it is, um, and let's see if this pops up. <clears throat> so um, I, I've just tried to encapsulate net zero in a picture here uh, by looking at the uh, the emissions history over time. Uh, that's annual emissions going up, 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 unfortunately. Um, and what we know, and I'm sure um, it, it, the sort of the, the basic point here is that, you know, temperature has has had pretty much a one for one relationship with the concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So it's the amount that's there that matters. Uh, what this shows is the rate at which we're putting them up there. And at the risk of being incredibly obvious, unless we reduce that rate to zero, uh, the concentration of greenhouse gases is going to keep rising and the temperature is going to keep rising. So that's really where the zero comes in. And people debate about this and people put the word net in. But, you know, unless we stop putting bad stuff in the atmosphere, the temperature is going to carry on rising. Um, the importance of this graph is the about the amounts. So the Paris Agreement uh, articulates this goal of 1.5 degrees as uh, as something we really want to try and stay within to to avoid the worst impacts of uh, climate change. 
and that's associated with a specific amount of tons of carbon. So it's the area under this graph, if you like. That's the budget we have to stay within. Uh, and it implies like a really steep decline in, in emissions starting now. Um, so we can't wait to 2030 or 2040. Uh, otherwise, it, it's just much too late. The only way the math works is if actually we achieve that steady decline starting from now. Else we'll overshoot that, that carbon budget. So from a global, social, political, economic perspective, the goal is to kind of to make that happen. I'll try and break that down a little bit into the how and then the, how that relates to investment um, as we go on. Um, it's, let's think whether I want to use a slide next. Um, I'll have to uh, see what comes up next. Yeah, so let's look a little bit about where those emissions are coming from because that, uh, and then I'll talk about um, how we think about this from an economic perspective. So you can divide, this is one way you can divide it. There are there are others. Um, so if you look at the pie chart, about 40% is energy. So that's, um, a lot of that's generating our power. Uh, it's burning coal, oil, gas to generate electricity. It's also how we heat our homes. It's when you turn on your gas boiler or, or whatever. That comes under energy. Um, next big category is industry. So that's quite concentrated in a few small sectors actually it's making steel making cement heavy industry highly energy intensive um the other big thing which doesn't get talked about so much but probably should be is the purple and the blue so it's agriculture and nature so that together is 25 percent you know we can't solve climate change unless we deal with that and within that you've got um the fact that modern intensive agriculture turns the land into a it, a carbon emitter rather than a carbon sink. It's about methane emissions from animals and it's about land use change. So we cut down the forests in order to grow beef in in, in the Cerrado in, in Brazil and so forth. So that's agriculture's turned into a big negative for the climate. It, it, com, com, it encompasses about 15% of, of emissions. And, you know, the, there's another other 10% from the fact that human activity is messing up natural systems to the extent that they're now becoming emitters of carbon. So sort of degraded peatland, uh, the ocean's inability to continue absorbing CO2, all of those things come under the heading of nature. It's not directly agriculture, but it's kind of human related. Uh, and the other big slice of the pie is transportation, cars, trucks, planes, uh, et cetera. Uh, so if you look at these, these uh, at a very high level translate to the things we need to do to fix the problem. We need to sort out the food system. We need to decarbonize the electricity grid. We need to do something with the transportation. It says electrify here. You can't electrify everything to do with transport, but it's a good chunk of it. We can talk about hydrogen if we want to later. Uh, and we need to um, protect natural ecosystems. And if we do all of those things, um, we've got half a chance of, of bringing that curve down so that we're getting towards the, the zero, which is really the only important number. <clears throat> um, so from uh, an investor's point of view, or let's say from an economist's point of view, um, if we're to achieve any of these things, it means like completely upending the global economy. It means that this low carbon transition becomes the dominant feature of economic and commercial life for the next 20, 30 years. Uh, which is kind of, which is not quite yet is kind of getting there but but we clearly need to do more on that but for anyone thinking about making uh, investment decisions whether it's a company or an in, or a investment institution or a human being you've got to recognize that this is going to be a really important factor now there's some um, as an investor there's two ways you can think about this um you can think about it as my job is to make as much money for my clients as I can, given what's happening in the world. Um, or, uh, and that would be, well, I'm kind of, I will just observe what the pathway is. I'll observe whether we're doing a good job at climate or not, or whether we're somewhere in between. And I'll make my investments on that basis. So, it might be if actually 
the low carbon transition is going completely off track, you think, well, actually, there's quite a lot of demand for fossil fuels. I'll, I'll invest in the fossil fuel business because that's going to make me more money because that's what's happening in the world. So it's basically just saying climate change is a really important thing and I'm going to incorporate it into my investments, but in a kind of value neutral way. It's just you're you're trying to make the best in a in a failing system or it just in the system doing whatever it happens to be. So that's, in a sense, there should be nobody who doesn't incorporate climate thinking into how they invest, make investment decisions, because why would you lose, why would you leave out dominant long-term factors from your decisions? That would just be crazy. So uh, we as an organization trying to make sure that everyone understands these things, the imperatives, the policy, the different industrial changes that would happen. Um, but but that's not really helping. It's just, you know, it, it's helping ourselves, at, uh, but it doesn't, uh, it's not intentional and it doesn't actually contribute. So the next stage, which from an investor means like a net zero strategy is saying, okay, as investors, how can we actually contribute to this? And that's the, that's where it gets tricky and complicated. Um, so I'll touch on some of the issues there. Uh, let, let maybe this is on a nice summary page and I'll turn off the video sharing for a second. Um, so as we do this, there are some positives, right? That, that we can get excited about. Um, the cost of a lot of renewable technologies just keeps on falling, uh, which has really, it's made more things more economic, more profitable. It's made it much easier to justify investing in offshore wind, solar, all sorts of things uh and that that's encouraging uh and the pace of innovation has been incredible um so all of those things are kind of positives that you can get investors and clients excited about uh there's a lot more data we understand the field better uh and all of that's a positive contribution so i'll give you a, a little example on the falling cost and innovation and this and actually the change in understanding so um Back in 2014, so only 10 years ago, The Economist magazine, which is fond of these sort of big sort of pronouncements of the truth from their perspective, uh, wrote uh, an article saying um, solar power is the most expensive way to decarbonize the economy. Ergo, the last thing you should be doing is investing in solar power and rolling out solar power. Fast forward to today, and the International Energy Agency says that Solar PV, so to, solar photovoltaic electricity generation, is the cheapest source of electricity there's ever been. You know, it, it, it's like you, it, it, and if you think about it, it's the only way we've ever been able to generate electricity that doesn't involve turning a wheel, does not involve moving a whole load of physical stuff around, giant turbines and things. It's incredible. Um, and, and that's the change of view that's happened over 10 years, and the cost of solar keeps falling. Um, you can say the same for various other things. So that's all, all really exciting. But I mean, we need to do clearly an awful lot more than we're, we're doing. Um, I'm going to, on the right, just give you a sense of what it feels like a little bit to sit in our seats as investors and maybe why things aren't moving as fast as, as they can. Um, firstly, actually uh convincing the people whose money it is that this is an important thing it, it sounds crazy but that's not obvious to how people think about it um i think most people uh less in america than in europe i have to say but most investors get that there are things happening that they need to take notice of if they're going to either make money or, or not lose money but I want to focus here because we're talking about net zero on the intentional part. What can we do to actually accelerate the transition? Um, so um, there's some, some challenges there. Uh, one is the investment industry is really bad at understanding the financial risk of climate change and therefore realizing that it's in their interests to contribute to a collective goal. So financial models just don't incorporate this in any sensible way uh, today. There are models out there, but they massively understate the 
uh, economic impact of the physical changes from, from climate change because they're just built in the wrong way. There's a big lively debate led by the actuarial community uh, to redraft these models and they're, they're becoming better. But generally speaking, when people... Financial people love models and projections and uh, statistics, and we don't have those things that say that if we don't solve this problem by 2100, there isn't going to be an economy at all for us to talk about, which is kind of the reality, but that doesn't feature most the way most people think, think about it. So rethinking risk is something that's important. But the thing I struggle with day to day is the essential, well, why us? Why is it our job? to do something about this isn't it the government's job isn't it people's job you know we're just supposed to my job as an investment manager is to make sure my clients have got as much money as they can have to do the things they want to do with it in 10 years time that's what i'm paid to do i'm not paid to do some other thing which might reduce their returns hypothetically who knows um so that's a um a big live debate because it it the, the, the challenge of net, the benefits of net zero are their collective. We all benefit if we all get it right. Uh, you can't be net zero by yourself. That's sort of meaningless. Uh, therefore, you only you, you, if you can do all the perfect things, uh, you don't get the benefit unless everybody else does the same things. Now, we're not used to thinking like that in investing terms. It's usually this... Uh, the um uh what's the expression um every man for himself if you like that that uh so we're supposed to take actions that benefit our clients specifically not that benefit everybody uh that's a real conceptual problem for people and it uh it's easier to get across if um actually if you're a human being so the way our, our our clients split roughly speaking is sort of endowments and foundations organizations that have a mission um you know cambridge university where alistair and i met would be one of those they have a they have a bunch of money which they invest but they're also an organization with a values and a mission uh the other part of our client base is very, very wealthy families, people with hundreds of millions and billions uh, to invest. And then there's pension funds. Funnily enough, it's the, the families and the endowments and foundations that are much more active in um, doing things about climate because they've got the flex. They can do what they like, really. And there's an argument for them to do it because they all want to exist you know, down the generations, if you're a family, or Cambridge University wants to exist for another 800 years like it's already done. Therefore, they care about the future. Pension funds are weird because they're very highly regulated and they're given very specific financial goals. And if you start doing things which are about driving net zero, which are different to what you might otherwise have done as an investor, Somebody, some regulator or some lawyer or some client is going to turn to you and say, why are you doing that? You're earning me a lower return. Therefore, I won't be able to pay my pensioners or, or do whatever that, you know, that's you're breaking your legal obligation to me. Um, now, we can probably as human beings think, well, hang on, that's bonkers, because why do I, I if I'm going to get a pension in 30 years, but then I to spend it on, or I'm, I, I have, there's nothing to eat, why does it matter? But that's not factored into any of these numbers or statistics that people think about when they're, they're looking at pension fund risks. So there's a whole sort of education process that has to happen. And this is a huge live political issue in the US at the moment, where there are individual states and attorneys general um, filing lawsuits against investment managers or organizations that are trying to incorporate, for example, climate considerations in the way that they make decisions. And they're saying that uh, this is uh, this is not your legal obligation. You're undermining the financial returns and you're somehow undermining the basis of American capitalism in some weird philosophical way. So. These are really, really big challenges in, in, in getting money moving to the right place. And 
unfortunately, it matters a lot more what happens in the US than it does what happens in the UK, where thankfully we're still a bit more, more progressive on this. So those are some of the challenges. Some of the other challenges are actually identifying tools that work rather than tools that just make you feel good but don't achieve anything. So I think there's probably been a little bit too much in the early days of net zero investing of thinking about things that, you know, make your portfolio look pretty in a way that, uh, but that don't actually have an effect in the real world. I'd give you a little bit of an example. Uh, imagine there's, there's hundreds of investments that you can own um, in, in individual companies. Some of them are high emission companies because they're steel or cement or they're power generators. And some of them are low emission because they're software companies or healthcare companies or something like that. So you can say, OK, well, I'm going to sell a bunch of those high emission companies, bunch, buy a bunch of low emission companies. The emissions associated with my portfolio are much less. And that's how people have been measuring this recently. They, What are your portfolio emissions? We need to manage our emissions of the portfolio down to zero. So in, in line with net zero. But I'd argue that's just a complete misconception of what your objectives are. Because if you do that, you've not actually changed anything in the real world. Uh, and the real world is where we need to change. So actually, we, what we need to do is change the behavior of the businesses that are high emitters, not just like ignore them. Otherwise, we're standing on the sidelines, not achieving anything. So there's been some kind of conceptual changes in how to think about this. There's a, I've got a little picture that maybe illustrates this which is this guy here. So on the chart on the right, you imagine two companies, company A, which is the kind of blue line and company B, which is the orange line. So company B is the software company. If I'm sitting in 2020 and my portfolio is entirely consisted of those, my emissions are half of, of the, the benchmark, say. And I, I feel good about myself. But that company is not doing anything particularly much about emissions. They might gently decline. But, but there's no intentionality about going to zero. But say that blue company, say it's a steel company, and say they are investing in the equipment and the technology, and you guys know about this in Sweden, because it's happening in Sweden right now, uh, that can decarbonize manufacturing steel, because they can reduce the iron ore with hydrogen rather than coking coal and also a whole bunch of other things. So you're starting with a really high emission business but its emissions are declining towards zero by net, by 2050. That's actually, we don't have a problem. If our portfolios are full of those things, we don't have a problem, even if our emissions are high today. Uh, and the best thing is to take companies that are high emitters who are not doing anything and changing them into things like company A. So uh, th this, is, um, this is the challenge of what we can do as investors, rather than to try and report good statistics while achieving nothing we actually want to contribute to change in the real world and not everybody who says they have a net zero commitment are actually doing any of those things um, so we have basically two tools that we can use on the left hand side there's what we call stewardship uh, which is um, this is how we vote because as investors we are shareholders in companies we can vote uh, at their AGMs. We can decide whether or not to reappoint the directors. We can do all of those tangible things. Um, and that's really important for big companies that are established because they don't actually need our money because they have they generate loads of cash flow. They don't need to come back to ask for new money. So the only way they care about their investors is if we turn up at the AGM and say, I'm going to vote against your re-election as a director. That's what gets their attention. Um, so that's, which will get their attention much more than just deciding not to own their shares. Uh, on the other hand, there's what we can, what we decide to own or what we choose not to own. So um, this can be actually funding climate solutions, funding renewable power, funding the kind of innovations that we need. But it can also mean supporting as an investor companies that are trying to change and doing the right thing because the changes come with a lot of upfront costs 
Uh, and as investors, we've got to be tolerant of those upfront costs and see through those and be supportive shareholders of the companies that are trying to change. Because if we shy away from that and stick with the companies that aren't changing, well, we're, we're all screwed as, as, as we've, we've seen before. So we've got to understand what tools we have and use them in the best way in the right places. Not try and say there's one thing we need to do in every situation because life's not like that. We need to pick the right tool and we need to work um, depending on what kind of organization we are with how we can best have impact. So like if you're Cambridge University, I, then I can't talk for them, so they're not a client, but I'm just using them as an example. Then the amount of money you have is pretty small in, in, in um, the great scheme of things. But you've got a really important name and you've got enormous credibility. So if you're an investor in, say, Barclays Bank, and you go to Barclays Bank and say, we're going to stop using Barclays as our banker, but we're also good, we're telling you why, because we just uh, we don't agree with your climate lending policies. And by the way, we'll also tell the world that, and we'll tell all our students, and we'll make a public statement about why Barclays uh, climate policies are incompatible with human goals. That's really powerful. So you're using the thing that you've, it's like the, the organizations say, sometimes say our name is worth more than our money. But there'll be other organizations where it is actually just the money and it's moving the money or the votes that matters. So picking the battles. I've on 25 minutes now, which is slightly longer than I wanted to spend. So it's probably a good point for me to stop and turn it back to the group and see the different kind of directions, the different topics of interest that you might have. So I'll stop sharing right now. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Simon. I'm just going to